Hi everyone, great to be with you again. Uh, Pastor Jeff Woodward from Metro Church Online here uh, with the second in our series of my story. You may remember the last one with Eileen Green. What a dramatic tale that was of some incredible adversities that she had to walk through. And yet, you know, not all resilience is about having a crisis in your life and having to journey that. What about things like having the resilience to avoid the distractions? Some of you are students, and it's so easy when you're in that kind of a space to get distracted socially or some other thing like that and not do what you're meant to do. What about the ability to be able to endure temptation? To be able to say, you know what? I'm gonna say no to that. I think resilience is a much bigger subject and a much more important one than just simply waiting for a crisis to come. That's why 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says this, Therefore, my brethren and sisters, of course, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labour in the Lord is not in vain. In other words, this is for everyday life. And so with that, I'm really pleased to be able to have a conversation today with none other than the magnificent Ashley and Debbie Schofield. Some of you, of course, have heard us refer to their daughter, Liz, who's in the creative team and worship leads so beautifully. Others of you will have heard us talk about Mitchell. Uh, Mitch to the rest of us, Mitchell at home. Is that the way it goes, Mitchell? It could go either way, depending. What is it when he's in trouble, Deb? Mitchell James. (laughs) Mitchell James, thank you. Uh, This couple are just brilliant people, but what a a journey of life you guys have had. I mean, I'll give them the quick timeline before we get into this discussion about how do you build family resilience? And I think you're going to love this today. Uh, But let me just check on here. Met in 1989. What month was it, Ashley? October. He was a man who's into the detail. In I, can't, I can't even remember the year, but he remembers it down to the month. <laughs> 1989 you met, then was it then that you both independently went backpacking to the UK? Yes, that's yep. right. That's correct. Yep. Yeah. And then you met up again there? Yes. Was that the way this That's goes? right. Mm-hmm. Yeah, we, we, we dated for two weeks. Oh, wow. I went here back, in Perth. Yeah, yeah, here in Perth. Oh. I went backpacking. Uh, for three, four months. So you months. obviously were smitten, fell in love and just said, yeah, no, I'm off. Yeah. No, yeah. she okay. wasn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, um, you know, we <clears throat> formed a, a close friendship. We knew that um, we knew that we really liked each other, right. but we knew that we were both going travelling at different okay. times. So then Ashley comes over four months later and right. we just pick up where we left off. So that was in Watford, is that right? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which is somewhere near London, is it? It's uh, 40 miles north of London. Oh, wow, yeah. okay. Yeah. yeah, and there was a, a little enclave of Perth um, young people there. Um, Mark, my brother, wow. um, Ashley's brother was there. Yeah, only for a couple of days. Ashley, so. yeah, yeah, Ashley's sister was there wow. for, for a while of that too and <clears throat> another friend from, from Perth. So we were all, we wow. had our own little Australian enclave there. I want to ask you about this because you told me that at Watford you very quickly started attending belonging whatever at Elam Pentecostal Church. Yes, in that's right. Is that yep. right? Yes. Yep. And that intrigued me a bit because, you know, when some people think of leaving home and going on one of these backpacking journeys, they don't just leave home, they leave values. Yes. And they abandon all that. And obviously you two didn't do that. You didn't mm. go there going, hello, no mum, no dad, mm. I can do what I like. You guys went there carrying the same values forward in your life is... Um, yeah, yeah. We, well, we we just wanted to find a church home wherever we were. It was yeah. an anchor point. Yeah. Really? Yeah. yeah, it was an anchor point. Yeah. Wow. And Something that we'd grown, grown up with. Yeah. Well, in my case, it was a little bit later than yeah. that. But, um, yeah, it was an anchor point for us. And, it, and, it, was and quite, it, it was quite a small church, so we kind of Doubled swelled the numbers, the numbers a bit. <laughs> yeah, well. But that was good for everyone. Yeah, you know, well. it was, um, yeah, it was, it was a good place to be for that time. We've, well. And we have friendships that have continued on to this day. I think that's so important yeah. because we're going to talk about resilience in the family, but a lot of it springs out of the parents. Mm. I, I meet parents from time to time who they want their kids to grow up well but they themselves want to take a different Mm. track. You know what I mean? Mm. And obviously for you guys, the seed of 
commitment and the seed of belonging and the seed of connection mm-hmm. has been a part of your life even when you were a single young adults. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. Well, exactly mm-hmm. right. And <clears throat> and then that you know that goes with you then even when we were traveling through Europe mm-hmm. we would meet all different kinds of people but you you bring who you are with you. You don't leave it behind. I think that's great. Because it either is who you are or mm. you've been living a kind of fake existence anyway. Wow. So it's got to go, the roots have got to go a bit deeper, hey? Did you ever feel, though, in that kind of a space, because you are a long way from mm. home and you're a long way from the scrutiny of mm. family, mm. did you ever kind of feel a bit like, I don't know, throwing uh, aside some of those values or was it just, no, no, this is what I believe, this is not what I inherited from mum and dad, this mm. is what I believe? I, I don't think we even thought about yeah, well, doing things any differently. That's so good. You know? Yeah. Um, and added to that, the, the family of God is worldwide. Mm. So wherever that's you true. are, you're still part of that's his so family, true. even yeah. if you're not in your usual church or your yeah, home right. church. So yeah. it just... I don't think we even think twice about it. It yeah. just is. So did the relationship in Watford <clears throat> blossom? Was that where it all, we look back and go, that's where it all started? We sorted a few things out. Did you? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't wasn't smooth sailing. Was it? <laughs> uh, no, it wasn't. Yeah, we had to kind of work through a few things together. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. Can I ask you about that for a minute? Yeah. Because, again, I think when it comes to resilience, so many people have the idea it's, a, you, it's almost like they save it up for crises. Mm. But I'd go, if you're going to marry somebody, mm. you better learn resilience mm. because you're going to, you know, everyone's so totally in love, you know, and then they start discovering the things about the other person that maybe they don't like so much. Mm. So was that a, is that a fair thing to say that yeah. you're quite different personalities? Yes, and- yes we are. Well, <laughs> yes, we are. Yes, yes, dear, we are. <laughs> and we come from different families. Yes. And we come from different ways of dealing with things. Wow. So all of that goes into the melting pot. But you really got to work through almost those cultural issues that yeah. are different between. That's you. a good point. Otherwise, yeah. you misinterpret the other person entirely. Yeah. Um, if you just judge them on what you've known, you've yeah. got to kind of get to know them to that level to say, well, <coughs> who are you underneath the surface? Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, we, we did. We worked through a few things together yeah. and then um, went, went youth hosteling um. around Europe. And, and I always thought, if I can travel with you, with Ashley, and we still want to be together by the end of that. That's probably a really good sign. Yeah, wow. Well. <laughs> mm. Wow. So, and here we are. <laughs> and we um, met people uh, in Norway that took, that took us back to their family home and um, they, they were, the kids were at a, a youth camp, a Christian wow. youth camp, and they were singing Christian songs when we went to pick them up and it was just an amazing time. Wow. Right? And then we also went to... A very unusual church in Finland. Yes. Hey. <laughs> and we went, um, you know, like we, we went, we ended up in a hotel that ended up being a cult. That was, that was another <laughs> A weird year. cult. That was another, yeah, well, that was another yeah, time, yeah. but really, you know, <coughs> yeah, yeah. You, see, you see all kinds of things and you kind of just, you bring, but that's you, another you bring thing the Lord I think into about all of that. Resilience, because if you live according to just, uh, what you'd prefer, what you'd mm. like, and you're not able to engage with people of different opinions yep. or people that maybe have a, a perspective that they strongly hold to that's different mm. to yours. Mm. Um, if every time you encounter that you have to run away and hide, mm. then to me emotional mm. resilience means I can have my opinions and have mm. my beliefs, but I'm not frightened of engaging with somebody else. Mm. Well, I mean, I think, and you know, in all honesty, Jesus was the model, yeah, was right. he not? I mean, yeah. he he was the Son of God mm. um, and the Light of the world, but he mm. went, he, you know, he mixed with mm. who were probably the wealthy and elite of his time, which were the tax collectors who yeah. were very rich, true, true, and uh, and the some of the religious people who were also very rich and very mm-hmm. top of their game, but living not very good lives. But mm. he he. That's where he was. Yeah, well. Yeah. So, you know, we can take our sort of 
oh. our guide and our um, direction from that. Yeah. Mm. So how long were you backpacking? Or did you did you come home at the same time? Or no, no, no. we didn't. Um, so I, I I'm going to go to him for the dates now. <laughs> <laughs> De- Deb left for Australia in November 1990. Can I just pause for a minute and go, <laughs> I, yeah, I'm just well done because <laughs> I remember my birthday and my wedding anniversary I work out. But that's a, so that's awesome, well done. So she was <laughs> coming back to be the bridesmaid for her best friend uh. um, and I stayed in the UK because I picked up a somewhat um, juicy contract, which... Because uh, uh, um, you're an accountant. Oh, sorry. <laughs> oh, I've, just said the, I've just said the really worst word. You're an auditor. Were you an auditor at the time? At that particular stage, I was a consultant. Oh, that's even... Yeah. Well, so what, it was doing yeah. whatever. That'll yes. get edited out. Don't worry about <laughs> that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank there, but. Thank so you. had you decided when you're over there, we're it? This is the one for me. Have you decided mm. that? Well, we were engaged. So oh, okay. Yeah, 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 we got engaged yeah. over there, and yeah. um, uh, Ashley doesn't like to take anything, you know, to chance. So um, we, he made sure that we were in Paris when he proposed. Ah, so in in you know, the city operator. of love. Wow. So you know, I think he thought surely she can't say no if I <laughs> if we're in Paris. But so I wasn't going to say no anyhow. So you come home. Yeah. Well done, actually. So you yeah. come home to Perth, you get married in 1991, is yep, that right? correct. Get married in 1991. What are you doing? You, mm. You're a dietitian, mm. um, and so you are working in a hospital setting, are you? Yeah, I started working uh, um, as the dietitian for the North Metro Health Service, okay. which included Osmond Park Hospital, Junior right. Lock Hospital, and everything else in between. It was right. like a catchment of 500,000 people. So that was wow. pretty busy, really, well, yeah. <laughs> when I reflect. <laughs> and Ashley, you came back to do what? As an auditor, I came back to working ah. for the public sector. Oh, ah, great. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And so that leads you then into what I think is a pretty extraordinary period of time where you travel a lot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So you go, first of all, is it is it to Samoa is the first one? Well, we went back to the UK in 1994 for another stint. Um, mm. Okay. And um, that was that was more backpacking, more okay. seeing different parts of the world. Um, but somewhere along the way you yeah. joined what's now called DFAT, isn't it, Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade? Only ever as a contractor. Oh, okay. Yes. Um, that's what takes you to Samoa, is it? Correct, yes. Two yes. and a half years yes. in total? So I was studying in between the time we came back to Australia. Um, I was studying a master's um, and a graduate diploma in uh, economic development. Wow. So I was interested in what's called international development. And so I picked up um, a contract, a uh, one-year contract in Samoa from end of 98 to the end of 99. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that was a defect. Well, are you on your own then or did the whole family go? I was on my own for the first three months, oh, okay. which was pretty tough. Yeah, well. Um, but when the family came over, by that time I had organised accommodation and a car and what you need when you're living in another country. So. But, but again, you, you connect to a church, Peace Chapel. Yes. I think. Peace oh, Chapel, yes, yep. yes. Yep. which was a great name. I love yeah, Peace. Yeah, exactly. Another name, Peace Chapel, with Pastor Samoa uh-huh. from Samoa. That was his name. That yeah. was his name, mm. which, uh, yeah. and that, that was a lovely a lovely place um, where you'd have expats and, and local people all worshipping together, people from all <laughs> over the world. Um, so not unlike Metro, which is quite multicultural. Mm, so mm. that was a that was a real haven. There were some top people in that yeah. place, and and you know it was just great to get to know them and to fellowship with them. And and you know Samoa, not like other developing countries, um, has just so so much more spiritually aware. So you know beautiful um, experiences there on wow. that. You know spiritually as well. I just love the fact that both of you. Um, you know, have connected with people rather mm. than just going, I'm here as a tourist. Mm. Uh, you know, I think we all know we meet so many people for whom mm. relationships now have, have gone into the mm. too hard basket. Mm. It's just too difficult. We move so frequently <clears throat> in Australia. Mm. 
I remember reading some time ago that on average people in Perth will sell their home at least every seven years. It's probably less now, mm. which means that if I go down my street, I go, there's only one person that's yeah. been living there as long as I have. Yeah. Mm. Everybody else keeps moving. Yeah. Mm. And that makes it difficult for people. We're all travelling a lot, mm. moving a lot. And I love the fact that wherever you go, you guys have made the effort and gone, we're going to yeah. connect, we're going to yeah. build relationships because it doesn't just mean friends, it means support, doesn't it? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. it does. It works and, both ways, actually. We and, support them. And, account yeah, and accountability. Mm. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, and um, there are still people all over the world that we we still pray for every week. Wow. Mm. And How amazing. People over Australia as well that we pray for every week mm. that we know are not, particularly ones that we know are not, Walking with the Lord wow. at this stage, wow. but we're just praying them into the God's kingdom. So, yeah. when you're in Samoa, uh, are both children because you've got two great children? Yeah. Are they born then? Are they with you? Uh, little Mitchell was with us yes. initially. Oh, First really? time. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Poor little love. He got stung by a really, really huge wasp. <laughs> this massive wasp there that he called Bitey Bees. Yeah. And uh, poor love, he got. He got bitten. <laughs> I'm laughing now, I know, but yeah, it wasn't very nice at the he's time. He's editing this, so I thought you'd be very careful. <laughs> um, yeah, so so it was just little Mitchell, um, and then the, in a subsequent visit to to Samoa, um, Lizzie was really quite a newborn baby. Wow. We just we just got through all the vaccination, mm. um, you know, child vaccination stuff for her, and then we went over. Mum and Dad came oh, wow. and supported mm. us for a couple of. Couple of good couple of weeks as yeah, well. Wow. So how important? Yeah, is. yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, but then uh, I'm kind of uh, we're going to talk about family in a minute. But you also did seven months in East Timor. Is That's that true. true? That, but that was by myself. Um, East Timor at that time was uh, rated as a conflict country. Wow. Um, and there were Australian troops and Portuguese troops there. Wow. Um, and did you feel was it dangerous? No. Nah. No, no. <laughs> really? Yeah, yeah. Probably more danger from the the UN. I sort of shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Hello, this. Ed edit that out. Please. It's honesty time. Um, um, then the, the useless drivers. Um, uh, no, there was no danger. It was just. Um, what were you doing there? Um, I was a budget advisor to the Ministry of uh, Finance and. Wow. Um, and um, it was just, uh, there was so much money flowing through that place. It was so expensive. Um, really? I lived in a, a one-room apartment, um, furnished, and it came with a bed and a chair. So I had a, all I had was a radio and a lap, laptop to watch wow. movies and stuff like that. But it was a... So that's seven months away from, because now you've got two children? Yeah, and that was, that was really hard when Lizzie was... Uh, crying over the phone, it was oh, like sta dear. stabbing in the heart, sort of stuff. Yeah, um, wow. So, it was, so how did you deal with that? Um, <laughs> I think that was that was a pretty tough time. A lot of prayer. I was I was connected to a, a church there, um, but um, it was um, it was very much myself and phoning oh. home and talking to Deb over the phone. Now, now, I think I've heard this right, that there's a family kind of a saying that goes, well, it's not a family saying, it's an Ashley saying, trails to adventure so long as I'm home by tea. That's pretty accurate. That's my motto, yes. So I'm really interested in this, seriously, because I think you're obviously someone who likes the home connections and the family. I'm risk averse. Yeah, but <laughs> gee, for a man who's risk averse, two backpacking tours around the UK, you know, Samoa for two and a half years almost on and off, yeah. East Timor in a conflict zone, I go, that really doesn't sound incredibly risk averse to me. So it's risk averse adventurism. <laughs> I know. <laughs> and that's what makes me wonder about the, the kind of anchor points is what you called it before to me, mm. these... Points that have held you, things like your faith, things like church, things like family, mm. Mm. making friends wherever mm. you are. Mm. And that all does take effort. I think mm. for me one of the things that I, I often notice is that uh, there's a reluctance sometimes for people to do the things 
mm. that'll build resilience or that holds you. You mm. know what I mean? Mm. You know, so yeah. people don't know who their neighbours are mm. or they mm. don't connect. They'll come to church but they'll attend the service but they won't be a part of the body. Mm. That's different. Mm. And it sounds to me like in all of that you guys have... Um, well, you have to be proactive. Mm. Yeah. You have to kind of make one step. I mean, you know, you can't just assume it's going to happen. I mean, even when we, further on, when our whole family lived in, in the UK for about um, six or seven years, yeah, well. uh, mm. the church that we went to, was, was which was Milton Keynes Christian Centre, was mm. a great church, a really Fantastic great church. church yeah. But it took us about three years to really wow. feel like we were really a part of it. Mm. So yeah. that was a long time really. coming. Mm. But but we just kept going. Mm. We kept, you know, doing what we could. We connected with the Connect group. We, you know, and eventually we were there, you know, and we felt so, like we were really mm. part of the family. But it, sometimes it just takes time. Mm. But don't well, give up. Good on you for persisting, though. Yeah. So how many schools has Mitchell been to? Okay. Because mm. you're in uh, England. Two, he would have had primary school and high school. Yep. And then back here for more high school? Yeah, six what or seven. What about eight? Eight or seven. <laughs> seven I'm gonna, or eight I'm going to defer to Ashley's numbers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think, I think that's resilience on his part as well. Um, so what did... Technically changing schools roughly every couple of years, especially in early, early times. Mm. Um, so I'd love to hear from Mitchell, by the way, yeah. as to, you know, what are the things that he believes have helped make him the resilient person that he is? Mm. So we might just have a listen to Mitchell for a second. Thanks, Pastor Jeff. Um, I know that from a very early age, I realized how privileged I was to have the parents um, that I know and love today. I know that those perhaps within school or friends around me, I, I see families that didn't have what I was able to have during my childhood. And that was a big deal. It was, the, it was the consistent and constant love and guidance and attention that we got from our parents. They were very hands-on parents. And what I mean by that is that we would always go on these great holidays. We would always do activities together. There would always be a great involvement and that above all things showed us that they really did care. And it inherently meant that we would have this great respect for them. On top of that, it was the why behind some of the dynamics in our family. So there were many confusing things sometimes. As a kid, you're growing up, you're like, why do I have to do the dishes? Why do I have to do these chores, these tasks? Why do I have to not do this and say this? And why do I have to say thank you? <laughs> all, these, all these things that you just don't know. And it was through love and grace that we were taught how to grow up in a godly manner. And I think that that was one of the pinnacle things. And that was God, godly-based parenting. Mum and dad would always take us to church, always have us involved in in all of the, the aspects of church, going to kids' church, um, praying every night when we go to sleep. I used to suffer from great nightmares and mum would always, without fail, come and pray for me and that would always make me feel better. And I will never forget that. And I think it was the connection that we had with other family members as well. I know that there's a lot of brokenness out there in some families, but we were incredibly privileged and still are, to have an amazing connection with all of our other family members, all our extended family. And that is due to our parents. It is because they are the ones that have kept that connection. I'm very thankful. I thank God for my parents um, and for the way that they brought us, myself and my sister, up. Um, yeah, thank you, Pastor Jeff. Thanks for that, Mitch. Uh, great insights from Mitch there. But... What are the things that you think you've done over the years, apart obviously from the example, are there things you can think of that you did deliberately that have helped build that kind of resilience into your children, into your family? 
Um, I think uh, I think overarching everything has to be um, that they that you give them the security of them feeling loved. Yeah, well. So I think yeah. that's I, I almost lay that down as a foundation. Tell tell everyone the expression you've used. You've told me a couple of times this one. What the emo- <laughs> no no no? You've got to make your love bucket. Oh yes, you've got to you've got to fill the love bucket. Yeah, that's a great. And idea. you've got to work out how to do that. <clears throat> Yeah. Um, and for me, um, I mean, I, I think none of us are born sort of automatic psychologists or mm-hmm. having great, you know, having it all together from our own psychology. So um, I found great help in books like um, The Love Languages. Yeah, great. So, I mean, that's, I mean, lots of people know about that book, but mm-hmm. The Five Love Languages, working out how your child and your spouse, actually, how yeah. they feel loved, what makes them yep. feel loved. Wow. So I think you, if you can tune into that, boy, that can make a big difference. Yeah. So if your child just needs quality time, you've got to make sure you, you set some time aside and just, you know, give that to them. Let me ask you about that, though, because, again, for some people in our world today, mm. filling the love bucket means I spoil you. Mm. Um, I always tell you how amazing you are at everything, uh, et cetera. Mm. Y- you know the deal. And we're not going to throw that out. Mm. But what part do you think does discipline, for instance, mm. play, balanced with all of those other things mm. that you're saying, what part does discipline play in helping someone become resilient? Well, my second book okay. <laughs> that, that I read was Boundaries for Children. Okay. So it's because um, we're not all very good at setting boundaries for children. Yeah. Sometimes we do it too strictly. Sometimes oh. we're a bit flaky and we don't. Mm. But I, I think Ashley and I both were of the belief that if you, if you say set a boundary, that you stick to it, right. so that there are there will be consequences for the child. Consistency. It's consistency. That's a good point. Yeah. 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 So it's not. It's about catching your child doing something good, not catching yeah. them doing something bad. But um, if if you know, obviously they they need the security of love, but they need the security of knowing where the edge of the the line is and, yes. and when they've crossed over it right. those consequences need to be in their world so if I as a parent start yelling and screaming at them then it's become my problem well wow. but if if we follow through on consequences it's their problem and they learn from it and you're doing it you're doing it out of love to to teach them and to guide them in a good way it's not out of any sort of punishment as such it's, yeah. It all works, I find, pretty well when they're at home and yep. you're looking after them at home. It's when they mm. start going to school. Mm. All of a sudden their world gets that much larger. Mm. Mm. They're not dealing with people that have the same mindset towards them as mum and dad may do. Mm. Now they're going to encounter maybe a teacher that's not as all the time nice or uh, school uh, mm. other students that yep. maybe won't treat them that mm. well. So you have... What happens when the kids bring home this thing happened to me at school today or whatever? Mm. What, how do you help them process all that? Yeah, um, I mean, first of all, listening. Uh, listening. Mm. Mm. Really, really mm. listen listen mm. to them and don't dismiss it as nothing because for them that is <clears throat> the biggest deal in right. their life right there and then it might seem trivial to a parent, might go, oh, yeah, you'll get over that. I mean, it's not, but it's not about magnifying. It's about really listening and then maybe doing a bit of problem solving because there's always strategies they can mm, use. Yeah, right. Get, you know, turn it practical and go, okay, what do you think you could do about that? Right. What are your options kind of thing? Because, um, because that then helps them not to be this victim, but it helps them to think, okay, there might be something I can do uh, and I do have choices. Yeah, that's great. You know, and then, but it's not about coming up with all the solutions either. Mm. I think it's important to let them process it through for themselves because I think there's a, a benefit in, in mm. them learning how to kind of work through these things which puts them in good stead for the future. I think you made the comment to me one day, Ashley, about apologising, mm. which for some people sounds like a... Like, if you're the boss, if you're the leader, if you're the parent, mm. you don't ever apologise. Mm. Mm. But you mentioned that to me as being something that you felt was important in the whole, not just in the relationship, but in helping to build a resilient child that they understand that we can make mistakes and mm. we can fail. 
Is that what you were meaning by that? Yep, yep. In in some situations, you lose your trolley <laughs> over actions that the kids may or may not have done. And uh, if you lose your trolley um, and you need to apologise. Yeah, I've right. done that a few times to Mitchell. <laughs> <laughs> not Lizzie? Uh, not so much Lizzie, no, no. Okay. no, no, no. Father son role thing. Oh, know, is it okay? Is, yeah. is pushing the boundaries, you know. Right. <laughs> Sorry, Mitch. Locking horns. <laughs> Locking horns. Um, but yeah, yeah, you know, definitely. Well, you want to raise, though, children that have strength mm. without rebellion. Yeah. Mm. And sometimes it can be a bit difficult to figure out which one of those two it is. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think having the, having the sense of, of honesty to be able to apologise to a child, I think. Brilliant. Well done. I think that's powerful. Yeah, is what it is because uh, I think that that child you, you got to put yourself in the child's position. How how does it make them feel to know that not everything is their fault? And mm. you know, when mum or dad yell, maybe sometimes that's not that wasn't a good thing that they did. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, I just think um, I just think you know it, it shows that it, it just models something for them yeah. as well. I think it also lets children understand that failure is not a permanent scar on your life, mm. yeah. that you can try something, mm. uh, that you won't always get it done right, mm. yep. you won't always be good at everything in your world, that there's mm. some things that you're, you're obviously gifted in a whole lot of areas. I believe that you just today received your latest qualification. Correct. And what is it? Can, can you tell us what it is? Graduate Diploma in International Law. See, I, I, if that was me, I'd probably have a T-shirt made up <laughs> saying that or something. But, but I want to ask you about this part because, again, it relates to with kids. Persistence mm. modelled by you both because your degree, you didn't go just full-time, you did it part-time with a two-year full-time block. Is that correct? Something like that? Um, I've just done three years of study for two uh, wow. degrees. Um, I just wanted to make the point that parents um, aren't infallible mm. and kids quickly wor work out that the parents aren't infallible. Mm. And so it's as you're both, they're growing up and you're growing up as a parent. Yeah, that's you, a great you point. Work, you work those out very that's soon very and that's why you've got a, another person in the household, very smart, um, mm. and they'll quickly work these things out. So, yeah, I think... I think um, focusing and being open to your children is very important as well and honest. But you don't get to those level of qualifications, I think, without two things. One is persistence, but the other one's also routines. You've got to set some, mm. you know, you can't just go, oh, look, I'll crash study the whole thing, I'll swat at the end and I'll get there. Well. <laughs> no. <laughs> no, please, please, just to prove it. Just say yes, again. yes. Pastor Jeff, <laughs> correct. <laughs> so tell me about, were there some things that you set up in your family life that you go, this is what we're going to do together as family. We're just going to, it's going to become a routine for us mm. that helps us to celebrate. Yeah, so it was very important, um, especially when I was in the UK, I was travelling a, a fair bit away. Um, that was my job. Um, so I'd go away for anywhere between two weeks and um, up to I think six was the longest I'd go oh. away. Um, so it was important for, actually it was more important for me rather than the family in one sense because as soon as I came home, I just wanted to spend time with the family. So we, we um, I'm not sure whether this is pre-UK or not, mm. but we had family night, uh, oh. Friday, night fam Friday night family fun. So we would pretty much do... Friday night was always set aside for the family. We would either watch a movie, or sort of a DVD, or uh, yeah. something like that, and we'd you know get some what we call cheesy comestibles, which is basically M and M's <laughs> and chocolate and crisps and, and all the um, junk, all the junk food, and maybe dietary approved junk. Yeah, yes, correct, yes, correct, yes, correct. Well, correct. Yeah, yes. You can spoil yourself but occasionally. Of course, absolutely. Or we'd go out to a hamburger place. You know, yeah. I won't mention the names of them. Um, yeah. um, and we do that, or we do we go to the pictures, um, something like that. So we always tended to focus on that on a Friday night, cause, and that was very important. Yeah, right. uh, I think 
it was more important for me in many ways. But I think <laughs> the children look forward to it. And yeah. if, if we hadn't organised something, they'd say, what are we doing on Friday? Yeah. Yeah. And so it became a, a really nice everyone doing something together Great. as a family. Yeah. Otherwise, time just you know slips oh, away so you got to be a little bit intentional i think mm -hmm. and that was that's a good relationship build and it's because it's all about fun it's <clears throat> you know it, it's a nice time speaking about that i'd like to hear from your youngest your daughter lizzie do you call her lizzie or liz 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 really Liz. Mm -hmm. oh, right. i call her liz okay I call or, her, I, or i call her babe <laughs> or depending on what she's up to i could be Elizabeth Jane. <laughs> she needs to do something. I think it would be great if we hear from Lizzie, uh, as we all know and love her as anyway, uh, about growing up and some of those things of how she remembers growing up in this family. So over to you, Liz. Thank you. No, really, Pastor Jeff, thank you. I consider it a privilege to be able to share some of my story. Um, the topic of resilience is actually something that I consider quite important to me uh, as I begin my journey as a high school teacher. It's a topic that I hear uh, my peers uh, always talk about, uh, kids talk about themselves and also parents. And it's something that I believe is a really important issue to raise, uh, not only within uh, teenagers, but from a very young age, building resilience um, is super important. Um, you know, I feel that I've been very lucky in my childhood to uh, be raised the way that I am. And my parents are two of the most admirable people I know. And uh, yes, they did pay me to say that. Um, obviously, there's, there's quite interesting uh, differences between the relationships that you have with your parents. And, you know, my relationship with mum, I think it grew out of how much time and effort she put into spending with me. And not only that, but also uh, just the simplest form and the simplest action of spending time with your daughter is one of the most important things I think you can do as a mother. Um, every single night, I would always go up to her and ask her, you know, can you say good night to me? And that wasn't just her saying, oh yeah, good night and then see you later. Um, it was actually the action that she had to then get up from, from whatever she was doing come with me, um, pray over me, uh, you know, um, and uh, sometimes she would sing to me and just little actions like that that actually meant a lot to me. And I loved it so much that I kept coming back for more. And that is something that's really important, I think, especially in uh, any, any, any child growing up, you know, having that kind of connection, it's actually a really good thing, especially when they keep coming back for more. Um, she would always read to me as well, which I think is a super important thing. Um, and sometimes she would get me to read to her. Uh, you know, she'd be like, you know, maybe that was because she'd had enough of reading to me for the past, you know, seven nights or whatever. And she's like, you know, you can read now. Um, but she was always a stronghold that I could run to in my time of need and someone who I genuinely consider be my best friend right now, which is awesome. Um, I, with dad and I, like, I, I always feel like there's something interesting about the relationship between fathers and daughters. Um, and I truly believe that despite who we are as, as humans, um, the call of a father is to emulate God the Father. And dad has been my best friend from the start and my favorite travel companion. Um, and not only that, he's also been such a driving force in uh, my accomplishments and achieving all that I can. Uh, so obviously we're growing up not only with building resilience through spending time and those interesting relationships that you have with your parents. Um, we also, you know, Mitch and I both had to do a lot of chores. We had to do a lot of uh, different tasks and mum and dad would you know, employ us to um, help them out in different things. Um, and dad would always say, you know, the reason why you're doing the dishes is to pay for board and lodging, which is such a lovely thing. Um, and you know what? I'm grateful because at the end of the day, all the cleaning that they got me to do around the house really helped me get the cleaning job that I've had for the past uh, four years, which is super awesome. So thanks, mum and dad. Um, but I honestly think that that is an important thing, you know, to have kids... Uh, you know, working 
with the parents and also to help around the house, it actually is an important thing. As much as I grumbled about it and I still grumble about it, it is, it is important to, to do and it does build a form of resilience and a, a form of um, independence as well. Uh, another thing that, you know, at the time I did grumble about, but I'm actually uh, quite grateful for is uh, when, I was, when I was a lot younger, um, I used to mumble quite a lot. And so dad sent me to speech therapy, which technically I still believe that I didn't need it. Um, but I'll be honest with you, after the speech therapy, I, I have never been a more confident public speaker. And uh, it's quite an interesting uh, difference to see. Um, and the, the actual uh, confidence that, that built in me was, it's, you know, I'm grateful for it. At the time I did grumble, uh, but yeah, yeah, I am, I am grateful for that. And I actually did move on to um, getting a distinction uh, at the London Academy of Music and Dramatic Arts for speech and public speaking. So, I mean, that's a pretty cool thing. And again, you know, obviously dad was that driving force of me achieving all that I could in that area. Uh, something else that was really important is uh, mum and dad did always encourage Mitch and I that if we were ever actually fighting or, you know, having the, the usual si sibling tussles that we have, uh, you know, they encourage us to actually work it out ourselves, which is not something that you see quite often. And at the time, you know, as a kid, I would be like, no, no, why can't you just fix it? But actually that action of figuring things out together and working it out on ourselves, that built a lot of resilience in me. And that also, I think, <clears throat> really helped our um, uh, connection and, you know, um, Mitch and I's relationship as siblings. So I think that's a really important thing uh, and a really amazing strategy that mum and dad used as parents. So overall, uh, I think that a lot of what mum and dad have done over the years has been to not only build resilience, but build that independence and ensure that Mitch and I are strong and um, able to move into the next step of life. And that's really what I, th I think parenting is all about. Obviously, I don't really have any um, experience with that, but, you know, seeing the differences in, in, um, in you know, where I was and where I am now, it's, it's, I am very grateful for everything that mum and dad have done. So yeah, thank you so much for giving me the privilege of sharing my story. Um, you've given us a lot to think about here, I think, with family, a life and about, I'll, I want to ask you one more thing, and that's about the long journey of it. You know, because life for every one of us, whether you're single, whether you're a couple or whether you're a, a parents and children, whichever way it goes, it all goes a long time. You know what I mean? Uh, life is not lived in moments. All those moments connect together. And you've got to be able to endure some of the inevitable ordinary days, whether it's in your marriage, whether it's in the family relationships, even for adult uh, children, you know, as you get older, you become a little more independent. And so the family dynamics are constantly shifting. And to build the kind of resilience into the family structure so that you go, you know what, family matters to us. Um, got any thoughts on that? What, what advice would you give, for instance, both of you, what advice would you give young single adults that are not yet married, don't yet have kids, but are going somewhere in my future, that's going to be there. What would you tell them they need to start doing now? Um, I think uh, start building good routine and, and um, uh, start really doing that whole personal development thing if you're not already right. doing that. Right. Because, um, you know, you want to be in as good a position as you can. However, I will say that I, I had personally I had a real fear about becoming a mother wow. and I think some people, maybe that speaks to some people. Um, and the Lord gave me a very direct word and said, you're going to be a wonderful mother. There was someone children. In, the, in the church came up to you, didn't they? She did. Yeah. She was a, a mature lady in the church who, you know, I, I would very much trust mm. with the words that she would speak to me. And she came up very tentatively and she said, Deb, I don't know, I don't know what this means to you because I didn't have children at that mm. time. 
she said, but the Lord wants you to know you'll be a wonderful mother of children. And, wow. you know, that just, every shred of fear that I had just broke off. Isn't that amazing? And I think, don't fear. I mean, when no one's perfect. Yeah. Um, probably everyone brings some strengths and weaknesses into yeah. being a parent. And I think, don't worry about it. It'll be okay. But you can do a lot for yourself now. Yeah. You can, and just know that when you're a parent, if, if you have any shreds of selfishness, they will just have to float out the door <laughs> because, because it's not about you anymore. Yep, it's about sure. family and it's about your kids. <laughs> Ashley, what do you think? What advice would you give? Well, um, connection with the wider family network is very important. Um, and mm, uh, uh, I just look yeah. at the influence of Ma and Pa Stafford and, and my uh, mother, um, in my the development of both kids, um, Mara and Pa Stafford put a you know a lot of time and effort into um, working with uh, or working spending time with the kids yeah. and also um, their cousins you know, the, yeah. the Stafford. So I think that's a very important. Um, being consistent um, and but it, parenting doesn't come with a manual as I, yeah, as true. I said and. You got to work your way through the, the daily issues as well as the long term issues as well. Mm. How important has it been for both? This will be my, my last question because mm. we could talk for a, mm. a long time here. And thank you so much for sharing your life. And thank you to Mitchell and Liz too for letting mm. us, you know, bring their family into everybody else's view. Uh, but how much has it mattered to you? as believers to be able to encounter whatever the situation was in, in mm. a pretty wild ride of life so far, mm. pretty well. I mean, I know you guys probably both think we've just average life, mm. but I go, no, that's extraordinary. Mm. How important has it been to be able to pray about those matters together or separately to be able to go, God, we have no idea? Yeah. Well, my goodness me, that makes all the difference. And I think I'd really love to add, you know, for people who might be a parent in the future or who are parents now, pray with your children. Every prayer that you pray is a seed wow. into their life. Mm. So the word, the words that you speak are seeds anyway. So mm. those prayers are, are, are spiritual seeds that you're yeah. sowing. Um, the children n would not go to sleep without we would have prayed for them mm -hmm. and in fact Lizzie always wanted me to sing the prayer to her oh. <laughs> so I would have to sing a prayer which I which was lovely anyway read to them sing you know sing to them pray over them yeah. um so there's a security that some of underlying all the things yeah. you've been saying to me I hear security. You're making your children feel yep. secure and yep. that breeds resilience all by itself. I think so. I mm. absolutely think so. And, and you know, when they go through their times where, you know, sometimes children go through that period of time where they have nightmares, well, we just used to pray it, pray it through, pray it through, continually pray it through. They got a cold, we prayed it through. I wasn't very good at praying healing for colds, but we just kept praying anyway. <laughs> Oh, the kids. I said, well, let's just pray for healing. <laughs> let's Good just idea. pray. Um, you know, just uh, I think God makes all the difference mm -hmm. because I, I actually cannot imagine doing parenting without without the Lord. I can cannot I imagine you, it. We better wrap this up, but can I get you to pray, either of you? Um, because I think there's a lot of parents who feel like you were saying before, Ashley, there's no perfect ones. And so many parents feel the guilt, if you like, of mm. not having done well enough. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then if their adult children encounter yeah. a problem, they think, oh, it must be something yeah. I did wrong. Yeah. And you've really got to be able to hand your children, yeah. even as adults, yeah. to God, don't you, and mm. say, we're going to trust you with that. Yeah. 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 No, I would love to, Thanks. Love to Let's pray. Let's pray. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, sure. Um, Heavenly Father, we, we just lift up um, parents and potential parents to you and grandparents as well, just the, these family units that, Lord, are just such a pattern of what you've put in place. And you knew best, Lord, to put us in families and you knew best that that's where we would thrive and flourish. And I pray for 
all of the families watching now, I just pray, Lord Jesus, that you will put your blessing of peace over them. Yeah. Lord, you would give them such wisdom. And you say, if you lack wisdom, just ask me and I'll give it to you. Mm -hmm. So I just pray that people will just turn to you, Lord, at mm -hmm. this time and just mm -hmm. say, Lord, I, I don't feel like I'm doing everything I could. So just lead me and guide me and help me in everything. Mm -hmm. And you will abundantly bless, Lord. I know you will right now. There's a blessing on families. There's a blessing on family life. Mm -hmm. Lord, Lord, you you have um, ordained it to be so. I pray for children that mm. are part of families. I pray, Lord, your blessing and direction mm. on them. Let not one of them be lost. Mm. And Lord, we will keep praying for our children no matter what, because we know that the, those seeds that we plant will bear fruit and that it will be good fruit mm. in your name, Jesus. Amen. 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 Hey, thank you so much again for sharing your great lives with us. Congratulations on your international, your diploma in international law, is that right? Graduate diploma. A big pain. <laughs> That's my second slip up today, really. Uh, graduate diploma in international law, well done. And thank you for, thank you for the whole family, really. You're such a blessing to us all at Metro, and we just love that and appreciate both of you and your wisdom for everyone's life. If some of the things that uh, we've talked about today have triggered something for you, I always understand you can contact us at prayer at metrochurch.org.au or simply use the Metro Church app and put your prayer request in there and there'll be people that will be praying with you. You don't need to be alone. You don't need to think I'm just here by myself, but there'll be someone who'll stand with you for that. God bless you. Thank you so much. Look forward to, uh, I believe the next one on Grow, again, is going to be on Resilience Part 2. So I hope that'll be a great help to everyone. Thank you so much. God bless you all.